was six, I had my first crush on a boy. When I was six, I really wasn't interested in anybody. When I was eight, my brother asked if I supported gay marriage. And although I hadn't really thought about the concept, I remember saying no, because I thought it was weird. When I was eight, I saw a gay couple for the first time on TV. Because I had never really thought about it before, I was a little weirded out. When I was 10, I had a crush on half the boys in class. When I was 10, I told everybody that I had a crush on my guy best friend. When I was 12, I was just excited for junior high and to meet new people. When I was 12, I had my first crush on a girl. It changed everything. When I was 12, I met Amelia Job, who would later become my best friend. I didn't like her very much. She was too uptight and moody. When I was 12, I met Sophia Mullen, who would later become my best friend. I didn't like her very much. She was too rude and insensitive. Even so, since, since moving, she was the closest friend I'd had. When I was 13, I came out as gay to the first person outside of my family. When I was 13, the first person came out to me. I'm gay. I was terrified. I was shocked. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I didn't really get the significance. We weren't even that close. She told me anyway. There was no guidebook on what to do. Just what little I could glean on the internet from am I gay quizzes to coming out videos on YouTube. The few sources available to me painted a bleak future of extremes. Either everything would go perfectly or everything would go terribly. In a world full of coming out parties and conversion therapy camps, it was hard to picture anything else. I didn't really know how to react. Everything I was told boiled down to just be supportive. But as time went on, it became clear it wasn't as simple as just be supportive. I mean, what does being supportive even look like? I realized there was more to coming out than just saying I'm gay. At first, I was just happy that she supported me. It soon became apparent, however, that the perfect reaction was the last thing I should expect. Insensitive jokes sprang up and tensions arose. I felt like she had no right to make gay jokes to me. I didn't understand that her insensitivity was coming from a lack of knowledge as opposed to a lack of care. I made jokes about it like I did any other thing. I didn't understand why she got so offended and upset. I was supportive of her and she knew that. So how could she take offense to obvious jokes? I didn't understand that the jokes were inherently insensitive to the community as a whole. A lack of communication was beginning to pull our friendship apart. We were both too stubborn to compromise and listen to the other side. I didn't want to be friends with someone who didn't fully support me. I didn't want to be friends with, with someone who was too dramatic and couldn't take a joke. I thought it was her job to learn how to be supportive in the right way. I thought it was ridiculous for her to expect me to know everything about something brand new. It felt like every week she'd make another offensive joke or inappropriate comment. How could I not get mad? It felt like even after so long, she hadn't gotten the memo. It felt like hit or miss whether she'd get angry at something I said and I didn't know the trigger. Like I was playing a daily game of Minesweeper. It was annoying. She'd get mad, move on, then get mad all over again, like a never-ending cycle. A big reason for this lack of communication and divide in understanding was the was the narrative that had been perpetuated through the media, through pop culture, and through everyday life. That narrative is that coming out and being come out to are two completely separate experiences when, in reality, they're closely interwoven. Neither side should completely control the narrative. If the person coming out is the only one telling the story, then it ignores the person being told and can twist the reality of the experience. Likewise, if the person being told is the only one giving the advice, then it tends to be a very shallow description of what the experience will be. In books and movies, the common coming out narrative goes like this. Kid gets outed. Kid gets bullied. But then kid finds love. And the whole school slow claps. And the bullies become allies. And everything is happily ever after. The message in these stories for the person being told is often just be supportive or be understanding. It makes the person receiving the news feel like they're going to have a moment when they suddenly understand everything perfectly. It ignores the complexities of the other person's emotions and experiences and writes off every LGBT plus person as the same. It simplifies coming out to a matter of support versus hate and doesn't allow for any nuance. The message in these stories for the person coming out is that they'll either receive a fairy tale ending or a sob story. 
If we fail to think of coming out as a joint effort, then we fail the people who need the advice the most. It can lead to skewed preconceptions, one of which is thinking in extremes. My biggest mistake was thinking in extremes. Books, movies, the internet, and school counselors told me stories about perfectly accepting loved ones who knew exactly what to say and how I was feeling. From these same sources, I also heard stories of rejection, homelessness, and suicide. Kids getting kicked out, disowned, and shunned by their friends. I had only heard these two types of stories for so long that eventually they were the only ones that I could picture for myself. My brain yo-yoed between the extremes of abysmal and perfect. When I finally did come out, I was relieved that things hadn't gone horribly wrong. But I was also disappointed that my story didn't match the ones in the movies. Although most people in my life had been supportive of me, I would always find myself wondering why they never said what I wanted to hear or did what I wanted them to do. Because of this expectation that had been built, she now expected me to be the perfect ally and have the perfect reaction, despite having no experience at all. Getting shut down every time I wasn't perfect was discouraging. It made me not want to change how I thought. These extremes are exactly that, extremes. Stories that are extraordinary tend to make headlines and trending tags, when in reality they make up a minority of experiences, with most instances of coming out happening somewhere in the gray area. Another one of our biggest mistakes was not being willing to make an effort to understand the other side. My inexperience made it impossible for me to know what was over the line. If I had just asked, then tensions wouldn't have been so high. Instead of placing the responsibility of figuring it out solely on her, if I had just explained to her what was okay with me, things wouldn't have been so tense. Although I shouldn't be expected to know everything, I was not entitled to forgiveness for everything I said and did. It was vital to make an effort to change and adapt the way I thought. Likewise, just because I had been through the struggle of being in the closet did not mean that I was entitled to the perfect response. Whether I liked it or not, no reaction could be perfect because nobody could read my mind. Even the best people will say hurtful things, but that doesn't make them unsupportive. At a certain point, you have to take responsibility for expanding your understanding of the other person, whether that's their identity, who they like, or their struggles. Like many other difficult conversations and situations in life, communication can make a world of difference. By simply putting aside your pride and making an effort to recognize the flaws in your thinking, you can move forward with yourself and with others, even if things don't go perfectly. In my experience, one of the hardest things to accept when coming out is the fact that negative reactions aren't the end of the world. If someone has a negative reaction, it doesn't automatically mean that they hate you. Have faith in most people's ability to change. It may take some people a bit of time to come around to the idea of a friend or family member being LGBT+, whether that's because of how they were raised, religion, or simply a lack of experience. In the grand scheme of things, whether it's school, that job, or another situation, it's temporary. Things are bound to get better. Now, we understand that these extremes do exist. There will be situations where LGBT plus people are kicked out, disowned, or abused because of their identity. And we're not suggesting that you stay in an unsafe or unhealthy environment on the off chance that someone can change. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to remove yourself from a toxic environment. While these extremes are important to acknowledge, they should not be the first story associated with coming out. They are not as common as we've been led to believe, and it's equally important to address the middle ground. We need more realistic expectations for both sides of the coming out conversation because the Trevor Project found that nearly 40% of LGBT youth have seriously considered suicide in the past year. A more supportive and more educated peer or guardian can save a life. We don't want people to have to go through years of confusion and disagreements like we did just because of a lack of knowledge. Today I stand here with Amelia Job, my best friend. Sometimes I still don't like her too much. She can be a little uptight and moody. Today I stand here with Sophia Mullen, my best friend. Sometimes I still don't like her too much. She can be a little rude and insensitive. But her coming out brought us closer in the end. Although it can take days, weeks, months, or even years, and whether you're an ally or a member of the community, it's, it's almost always possible, possible to reach a place, place of understanding. understanding. Thank you. Thank you.